I want to introduce uh, our topic a little bit differently today. Uh, I want to give you a little riddle, and I want to see if you can guess the answer. This is how it goes. <laughs> Someone's been to Sunday school. <laughs> Hopefully the sermon is about Jesus, uh, but a little more particular as well. Here it goes. This thing, all things devours. Birds, beasts, trees, flowers. Gnaws iron, bites steel. Grinds hard stones to meal. Slays kings, ruins towns, and beats mountains down. What is it? Time. Who nailed it? Who just nailed it? Sean over there. Lord of the Rings fan over there. No joke. The first answer last service was, you stole that from Gollum. Like, that was the, someone just yelled that out instead of the answer, time. Uh, the answer is time. It's the only thing that every person, each one of us, all creation is, is worn down by. That's what this riddle talks about. It's one of the most valuable things in your possession. It really is a strong indicator of what you care about. Even more, I think, than what you say, your actions and how you spend your time shows what you care about. Yet, I think it's the one thing that most of us feel like we never have enough of. We often find ourselves feeling like we wish we just had an extra hour of the day, that we didn't have to sleep so much as we do. Uh, We get agitated when we feel like people are wasting our time, not efficient with our time. Um, you might have felt like this, I felt like this, a lot of people feel like they're victims to the demands on their time, that they're not driving really the car of how their time's being spent, that they're just kind of locked up in the trunk, and all the demands that are coming at them are just driving them in a place they don't want to be necessarily. And man, we, we live in a world where we get really excited, we get really jazzed about uh, devices, systems, organizational tools that make our life more efficient. But I think it's without a doubt that we are more stressed, we are a generation that's more overwhelmed and anxious than any other one in history. Uh, I, I could give you a lot of stats, I'm not going to spend time doing that, but, but one that I find is so interesting, guess how many um, hours of sleep the average person got just about a, a little over 100 years ago? Who just knew that? A.G. A- but you were in the last service, right? <laughs> Where are you? Where is she? Is she like down the steps? <laughs> Love that sister. 11 hours. Thanks, AG. Uh, hey, for a lot of you, that's like half of that is a good night's sleep. I found it's really rare to come across anyone who says that I am satisfied with both one, the amount of time I have, and two, that my time is really being used effectively. Even this last week, as I was starting to write this sermon, I I had my day off and I was getting so agitated because I had all these things that I wanted to do, had to do on my day off, and all these really important people that I love dearest were getting in the way, right? And friends, what I want want to show you this morning is that God cares so deeply about how you use your time, and fortunately, he doesn't keep silent about how we should use our time. And that's why Paul through, or God through Paul says, uh, about time that we're going to dive into in uh, Ephesians 5.15. He says, look carefully then at how you walk. And so in our text this morning, God's going to give us wise and unwise or, or wise and foolish ways to spend our time as Christians. And whether you realize it or not, every one of us has priorities and, and kind of principles that guide how we invest our time, how we spend our time. And my goal and invitation for, honestly, that's what it's been for me this week and for you this, to, this morning is to just examine how do I use my time? How do I utilize the precious resource God has given me against these three principles that I think we see here in this text? And just for a minute before we keep moving, I, I want to, we're, we're in a journey through Ephesians, right? Verse by verse. And uh, you really have, you cannot understand the context or, or really the, the good news, I think, of this uh, verse, unless you remember where we're coming from in Ephesians. Remember, Ephesians is one letter. It used to be read just to the church as a whole. And so, the first three chapters of Ephesians, if you were with us, um, these commands and the passage we're with today are all spilling out of an overflow of the first three chapters of Ephesians, the already good news accomplished realities of the gospel. In those first three chapters, Paul says, basically, you guys are spiritual billionaires. You have inherited a blessing. You have every spiritual blessing is what he says. And he says, uh, these are just some, the list of few that we covered in past weeks. That God has given you every spiritual blessing. God chose you. God redeemed you. God forgave you. 
God adopted you. God invited you into his work. God is now carrying out his eternal plan through you, through the church, his people. And the invitation before we just start in this today is just to sit in those realities. And if you are in Christ, those things are already bought, paid for in your account, your spiritual account. And it's out of that rest, out of that fortune that we have in Christ that we follow these commands. Uh, this command really is like, this is kind of how, if you're a spiritual billionaire, this is kind of how you roll, right? Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we covered walking in love, then walking in purity, walking in, um, walking in light, and now we're going to cover walking in wisdom, namely in light of our time. And so the, the thing I hope you guys get today, and that I've been getting today, is that, that we would be a people that walk in greater wisdom with our time. So I'm going to go over three principles. I'm going to ask them, though, as questions um, that I want you to be asking yourself as we go through them. So uh, the first one, this is going to seem uh, kind of obvious, but, but I'm excited to delve into it. First question is, are you investing your time wisely or are you spending it unwisely? This is pretty clear in the text. Ephesians 5.15, look carefully at how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. Um, that obviously brings a question, what does it mean to spend time wisely versus unwisely? Well, I think it's hard for us to talk about wisdom without going to the book of Proverbs. Uh, Proverbs is like the Bible's version of Twitter, uh, in a sense. It's full of short, pithy statements that contrast two things. Contrast um, the foolish or unwise life and the wise life. Um, and there are lots of principles in there. I don't even remember how many characters you get in Twitter anymore. It's more now, right? Anybody know? AG doesn't know. I don't, where's, where's my girl AG at? 215, okay, thank you. Yeah, so every, every proverb will fit in there easily. And there are so many principles in Proverbs that impact our time. I really just want to focus on three. Um, so let's focus on the first one. Wise versus unwise. Fear of man, unwise, versus fear of God, wise. How does this affect our time? Listen to Proverbs 29, 25. The fear of man lays a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is safe. Fear of man means your life is ruled by the approvals, the opinions, the criticisms of people. On a day-to-day -day level, you wake up more concerned about the approval or at least not getting the disapproval of people in your life more than anything else. The fear of disappointing a person can be more um, intimidating in your mind or greater in your mind than the fear of actually disobeying God. Uh, another term that uh, I use here is just you're a people pleaser. You live your life to please people. And what Paul says in Galatians 1 is that you cannot please God and you cannot please people. And that's true of your time. Here's what he says in Galatians 1. He says, For am I now seeking the approval of man or people or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. So he's saying you can't please God and ultimately please people at the same time. And we can fear or, or, fear or try to please, ultimately please all kinds of people in our life, can't we? Uh, you can ultimately try to fear or please your boss. And what that would look like is no matter what demands are placed on you, no matter how unhealthy, uh, you can never say no. You can never negotiate. Uh, maybe you have an ultimate, ultimate pleasing or fear of your parents. That even if the Lord is calling you to something, if they want you to kind of turn back or go away from a ministry or, or, um, or they have a different opinion about your career path, you can never disagree. You can never negotiate. Maybe you have a fear of your friends. I don't mean you're like scared of your friends, but you have like five things going on in your day. They invite you to something they're doing and you can't say no because you're afraid you might disappoint. You're afraid they might be displeased. Or, or maybe you just struggle with uh, fear of man's cousin, FOMO, fear of missing out. Uh, I do a lot. Um, and if you have a fear of man when it comes to your time, you are likely overcommitted, you're likely anxious, and uh, your priorities are determined by other people not you, and especially not the Lord. And so that, that's unwisdom. That's what um, lack of wisdom or foolishness with our time. But wisdom, um, Proverbs 9 says this, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So wisdom starts with fearing the Lord, and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. That's Proverbs 9.10. Fear of the Lord means that we are just acutely aware that our, that our loving Father is watching evaluating everything we do, and our time is accountable to Him and no other person. It means we wake up every day looking to God and, and saying, man, remembering that He is already pleased with us if we stand in Christ because of what Jesus has done, that He has given us His account of righteousness. And then, so we, we go hard on loving people, but we're not enslaved to their approval or disapproval because we already have the riches of the Father's approval. 
And it's out of gratitude to that that we just look to God and say, God, I just want to serve you with the time that you have given me. You know, one of the applications of that, what that means, is that we can say this magic word that a lot of us struggle to say. It's the word no. (laughs) Doesn't that sound sweet? Doesn't that sound like free? I can say no to something? Uh, We can say, if God hasn't gifted us in something and we get asked to do it or we don't have the time uh, to set aside to do it, we can say, no. It's a little hesitation here. If God has called us to, to Sabbath and rest and, and not uh, be, uh, be available for, ever for work on a Sabbath day and someone's blowing us up on the phone, we can actually say, no. no. Yes, there are healthy realities with no, right? Okay, so we can rest. We can say no because uh, we're pleasing God, not people. Okay, that's principle one. Second principle, this one's getting me, I think it's probably going to get you a lot, um, hit me a lot this week. Again, unwise, wise, unwise, hurry, hurried, versus slow, wise, okay? Hurried versus slow. Listen to this proverb, Proverbs 21.5. The plans of the diligent surely lead to abundance, but everyone who is hasty comes only to poverty, I actually really like how the message translates this verse. Uh, It says, careful planning puts you ahead in the long run. Hurry and scurry puts you further behind. You may not use the word hurry, uh, but what you do use and you hear a lot is, is, uh, is the B word. You know what that one is? Busy. What's the, the top thing that people say when you ask them how you're doing? Hey man, how you doing? Hey sister, how you doing? I'm good, but I'm busy. You had a lot, right? I use it a lot. I'm trying not to say it. I'm, saying, I'm not going to say the B word. I feel like everyone is busy. Uh, young parents are busy. Students are busy. Empty nesters are busy. Retirees are busy. No matter what life stage, it feels like people are feeling busy. And in a world where we can always be productive and, and connected, just about every one of us, I think, is addicted to hurry. But there's a big problem with hurry. You will see, in in your hurriedness, you will see people as obstacles in the way of your to-do list instead of image bearers to minister to in love. If you're in a hurry, you will react instead of act intentionally. If you're in a hurry, you aren't listening to God. Your head is just down. If you're in a hurry, you fail to focus on the most, most important issues and people around you. Ronald uh, Rawheiser, he, he writes about uh, hurry and distraction. It's a longer quote, but I think it's worth it. The danger of it. Listen to this quote. He says, We, for every kind of reason, good and bad, are distracting ourselves into spiritual oblivion. It's not that we would have anything against, it's not that we have anything against God, depth, and spirit. We'd like these. It's just that we habitually are too preoccupied to have any of these show up on our radar screens. We are more busy than bad. We're more distracted than non-spiritual and more interested in the movie theater, the sports stadium, and the shopping mall, and the fantasy life they produce in us than we are the church. Pathological busyness, distraction, and restlessness are major blocks today within the Christian spiritual life. Shorter quote you may have heard, if the devil can't make you sin, he'll make you busy. You heard that one before. This is the big problem with hurry is that we would get to the end of a day, the end of a week, the end of a month, the end of a season, maybe the end of our life. And we'll finally pick up our head and we'll be far from where we hope to be. In exchange for investing anxious toil, anxious hurry, anxious busyness, we'll, in exchange we'll find our relationships colder than we would have hoped, our intimacy with God more distant than we would have liked, and our joy to be really elusive. I think just to jump on the language of the, of the Proverbs, I think they would say, hurry with your time is foolish. But the Proverbs invites us to wisdom. In, in this proverb, it's the word diligent. Diligence means we're taking care, we're, we're planning, we're taking thoughtful action. And you know what this actually causes us to do? A word that doesn't sound so good to us, but a word that I think is good news to us is to go slow, to slow down. I don't know if you thought about this, but, but slow is really, a, it's a really negative term. Like you say, hey man, like, like my wife's biggest, my wife and I's biggest conflict ever, or like consistently is like that we have different speeds, especially when we're getting out of the house to go to a wedding or something. And she goes a little bit slower than me. And it is, uh, it's not an inviting turn to me, but this is meant to be inviting 
We're meant to slow down with God. We're meant to slow down with people. We're meant to slow down with our work. Walter Adams says, to walk with Jesus is to walk with a slow, unhurried pace. Hurry is the death of prayer. It only impedes and spoils our work. It never advances. We can slow down. And um, one of the things that's really helped me, I, I want to invite you to, to something that sounds crazy. I, I did not. This is not from me. It's from an author. But I want to invite you into something that sounds crazy to, I think, our culture, and it's this. It's to embrace God's gift of limits on your life. Embrace God's gift of limits on your life. If you think about it, you, each one of you, each one of us, we have limits on our life. We have limited energy. We have limits because we have to sleep. We have limits on our social capacity. Some of you, a lot more than others. Um, we have limits all over our life, and too much we see those things as bad, as obstacles, as, uh, <laughs> as things that are against us, not for us. But uh, God actually says in, in the Word that the boundaries of our life fall in pleasant places, that His limits on our life are actually meant to be a good gift to us to embrace and to love and not to kick against. So we embrace the limits that God's given us. We can eliminate hurry in our life. Okay, hurry, first, slow. Let's do one more really quickly. Another um, principle in Proverbs, Proverbs talks a lot about laziness. So lazy, unwise, intentional, wise. Proverbs talks a ton about laziness all the time. Proverbs 10.4, here's an example. Lazy hands make for poverty, but diligent hands bring wealth. So laziness with time could be doing nothing. You're sitting in front of a screen, just binging screen time and entertainment. But laziness can also look like investing a lot of your time in things that are not, or that are, are, what actually says, worthless things. Listen to this proverb in Proverbs 12. Whoever works his land will have plenty of bread, but he who follows worthless pursuits lacks sense. Another proverb shortly after that says that just talking a lot, being constantly just talking but not doing is actually a form of laziness. So we can be talking a lot. We can be busy with lots of peripheral things in our life, and that's still be in the category of laziness. You can mask laziness with busyness. If we're always putting off the important things, kind of for busy piddling around, that can be laziness with your time. And the call of the Proverbs here is intentional work, diligence. It's not calling us to excessive hurriness, but to use our time that blesses us and others in an overflow. And we can look more uh, at the principles of Proverbs, but really I just wanted to, to look at these three um, we could go on and on and on of how these things impact our time. These are three that I think impact us a lot. And, and before Paul, Paul says this phrase, back to um, verse 15, he says, look carefully at how you walk. E another word for that, examine yourself. Examine how you're spending your time. A wise person examines their time and how it's being spent. And can I just give you a few just practical applications of, of how you can do that? I'm going to just one sentence each. No, we're not going to go into these. Think of your time like a precious resource, like money. What do you do if you want to be responsible with your time? One thing is you look back to see how you're budgeting your time. So looking back at your calendar, how is my time being spent, right? Some of you don't have a calendar. If you're struggling with your time, a calendar might be a great idea. Uh, two, schedule blocks of time. This requires a calendar, again, that actually line up with God's priorities for your life. We'll talk more about that. And three, I, I double-dog dare you to do this this week. Ask a trusted friend how they are perceiving you spend your time. Hey, does it seem like, am I hurried or do I seem like in the moment? Or do I seem distracted? Does it seem like, um, like I'm, I'm lazy or a hard worker? Does it seem like I, I want to please people or does it seem like I want to fear God with, with, with my time? Those are scary questions to ask. Trusted friend, someone that's a uh, believer is going to speak the grace of the gospel into you, but... Uh, just how are other people seeing your life lived out in your time? And guys, you're going to see this theme as we go through this. There, we, we fail at these things all the time. And ultimately, it, it turns us back to Jesus, who walked out wisdom with perfection. Jesus walked in perfect fear of the Lord. He took the wrath of man because he was always pleasing his Father. Jesus walked slowly and intentionally. I, I love this about Jesus' life. He always seemed like he was not in a hurry, even though he had more demands on his time, I think, than anyone. He stopped to minister to the person in need. He snuck away to spend time with the Father. He never seemed hurried. And Jesus definitely was not lazy. He took three years and worked hard to bring eternal salvation to the world. John actually says at the end of his gospel that if you recorded everything Jesus did, uh, the libraries of the world couldn't contain everything that he did because he was working hard. 
So that's first. Are we spending our time wisely or unwisely? Second principle, are you spending your time for the temporary or investing it for eternity? There's a lot packed into verse 16. Listen to verse 16. He says, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Okay, so first, what does it mean the days are evil? So he's talking about the age of time that we currently live in, in between, uh, in another place, Paul calls it this present evil age in Galatians 1. So as Christians, he's saying we're in a transition time. We're in between uh, when Jesus has died on the cross, ascended as the right hand of the Father, and in between this other time coming when Jesus will return and make all things new. And he's saying in this kind of transition time, in this, uh, the last days it's often called, uh, it's a time where we are still waiting for Jesus to return to make things final. And in this time, Satan is actually allowed to wreak havoc, to, to see evil um, uh, spread in the world. And it's often called the last days because it's brief compared to the eternity that we have ahead. I was thinking, I'm doing a lot of um, wedding ministry right now. I was saying, this is just like engagement in a, in a sense. The promise is marriage is there. They got the ring is on the finger. The wedding is being planned, but the wedding day has not happened yet. And uh, in the meantime, the stress of wedding planning, uh, crazy parents uh, or crazy aunts, uh, budget conflicts are wreaking havoc and, uh, and craziness in the relationship. And in the moment, engagement feels like it's feels like it's forever. I don't know if we have any engaged couples in right now. We had a couple in the last one. They're like, hey, I got some amens during it. Um, because it seems like it can last forever, but it really is a light and momentary thing in the long life of a marriage. And that season is meant to just create a longing for the wedding day, for the marriage. And it's because the days are evil, it's because Satan is still allowed to wreak havoc on the earth, that it means our time does not naturally bend, naturally flow to create good things, to create good purposes. It naturally actually dissipates into meaninglessness and even evil. What this verse saying? I, I like to fish. I like to fish in rivers, and I, I keep. I always think about wading upstream uh, when I think about this verse because I. It, it's like the flow of the river is rushing against you, and if you just, if I just let myself go, if I just stop putting forth effort, I would just get washed down the river. Uh, and for me to get to like this honey hole fishing spot that I'm going to, it takes intentional effort. I have to. It's actually hard. I have to try to get there. It takes a lot of intention about where I'm going to go and how I'm going to step. And I really think it's the same way with our time, is that the pressure and momentum of time is pushing against us. Um, that our time, or our time, the pressure of time, the momentum of time is more of it to be, to be wasted and not used well for eternity. And we have to, Christians cannot relax and take it easier. We will just be swept downstream in a sense. And so Paul's saying, Christians, you cannot relax or take it easy when it comes to how you spend your time. It takes effort and discipline and intentionality. And it's because of that, Paul says, make the best use of your time. I love the word here that Paul uses. This Greek word literally means like buy back, redeem. It's used in Galatians 3.13 like this. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. It's the same word. So Christian, your invitation is to take the brief time that naturally slips away, naturally dissipates, naturally bends towards evil, and actually see it in God's grace redeemed for eternal good. It's a beautiful reality that we can take the fleeting time slipping away through our fingers, yet God's invited us and empowered his people to take those fleeting evil things and see them converted for eternal fruitfulness and eternal good. And we see this in other places in the scriptures. Jesus um, gave this great invitation for us to invest our time forever and eternally. He's, uh, in Matthew 6, he says this. He says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasure on earth, where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So usually in this verse, I think it's naturally for us to think treasure equals money, but think about it. How valuable is your time? right? It definitely is a treasure you have. It's incredibly valuable. It's incredibly valuable. And Jesus says you can spend your time in a couple ways. You can spend it in a way that won't last. Or in one day you'll suffer loss. Or you can spend your treasure of time in a way that won't be dissipated, that won't disappear. The invitation from Paul and Jesus for the Christian is to remember that what you do in the short time matters forever. 
You can either spend your time in a way that you'll never see its return, or you can invest it eternally to see the reward last forever. You guys know that um, really cheesy, like Tim McGraw song, Live Like You Were Dying? You know, I went skydiving, I went rocking mountain climbing. You guys know that one? Anybody? That's an old one, man. But anyways, everybody get a little misty eyed when they listen to that one? Anybody? Tim Wilkerson raised his hand in the last service, but I don't think he's here anymore. <laughs> Sorry, Tim. I think for the Christian, uh, it's a cool sentimental song, but for the Christian, it's not live like you were dying. It's actually live like you're going to live forever. Live like what you do here matters forever. And I want you to think about it for a second. What, what are the things that are going to last forever? The, the list is actually pretty short. It's really God, His, his Word, His everlasting love, and, and people, the souls of people, you and I. Everything else is temporary. Jesus is going to come back and push the cosmic reset button one day, and make everything else new. We long for that day. But investing eternally means we invest in our relationship with God. We invest in His Word and prayer. It means we invest in people, those lost and those in the church. And I love, it means that we can take the temporary things in our life and see them converted, buying back, redeemed for eternal reward, eternal payback. The, the temporary temper tantrums of your kids can be redeemed for eternal fruit as you minister the gospel to them. Taking time to pray for so, taking just a, a, a short time to pray for someone's salvation and for their healing can be redeemed for eternal impact in their life. Investing to serve the poor can be redeemed, just, just that no one else sees, can be re, redeemed to point to an eternal Savior who came to rescue the spiritually poor like us. And you heard about trials last week. When we trust God in our temporary fleeting trials, they can be redeemed to be eternally making you more like Jesus. And so I, I feel this, and you do too, that the, 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 the swift current of our culture is to focus on the temporary, right? To exchange, to overlook the eternal reward of, of personal worship and devotion to God for just a few more emails or a few more minutes of study. Uh, to turn, turn down the eternal investment of investing in your kids for the temporal entertainment of a screen. Uh, maybe to shrink back from the eternal investment of sharing the gospel with a non-believing friend in exchange for the temporary safety of, of not offending the relationship. But friends, we're, we're to live this short life for the eternal age to come. What you do here will resound for eternity. And um, there's an illustration that I, I did not create, but I, I think it's just a helpful picture to picture this. And so I actually need a volunteer. I'm going to get my boy Danny up here. Come on, Danny. Yes, sir. I want you to take this rope, and I want you to walk that way until we get to the end. I don't know. Yeah, keep pulling. There we go. Just don't hit Shannon. Oh, hold on. Oof. Didn't foresee this. I know. Let me. Yep. Oh, good. Look at Iman. Yeah, good job, Iman. On the fly, man. I want you to think about this rope. I want you to think about it as time. I want you to think about it as your life, the time of your life. Um, this rope, okay, you're good. Give me a little bit more slack. Thanks, Danny. Danny is an eternity away. This rope goes on for eternity. This is the time of your life. And God, I think, is inviting us. What does it look like to invest eternally in the whole rope, the whole eternity of your life? But um, this black tape right here represents your, your life here, your, your birth to when you die. It doesn't end here. Your soul, you go on for eternity. But guys, I think the current of our culture is saying, take your time here, your treasure here, and invest it for this, like, this, like better, just, uh, just this better job right here. Or, or invest all your time and money so you can just have the retirement that's just better, like right here, and so you can be more comfortable here. Or in, invest more, um, just, just turn away these kind of priorities that God's given us to invest just at the end of your life here. Or we, we spend all our time, I spend all my time struggling, thinking about every little, just, just how am I going to make... Uh, some point on this life better. And I am not thinking at all about the long rope of eternity. And so the invitation from Paul for us today is like to think carefully, make best use of the time for eternal investment. What are you doing here in the black is going to last on forever. And as we think about this, I think you think about Jesus. Jesus had three years, had three short years of ministry, he lived for 33, had three years of ministry. And we, 2,000 years later, are still gleaning and, and walking in the internal investment that he made. He lived for the rope, right? He lived for eternity. 
And for you, I think that question is just, how are we living our life? Are you thinking about, in your life, are you thinking about using this short black tape, this short snap that you have to, uh, to really invest? The, the reward of your investment uh, is going to last. The effects of your eternal investment in your ministry will last forever. And that's not a shame. Honestly, you should look at this and think, this is, what an invitation that God can take this and make it just keep lasting on and on for good. All right, Danny, you're good, man. You can come back. Thanks, brother. <laughs> Danny gets a hand. So are you living by the rope or by the tape? Is your time being invested eternally or, or temporary? Thanks, man. Yeah, you just leave it there. Third and last principle. Are you spending your time according to God's priorities or your priorities? Uh, Ephesians 5.17. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Notice the opposite of foolish is not wise or smart or well-studied or, or getting a degree or well-cultured. Uh, it's, it's understanding God's will. Another way to say this is if you're not following God's revealed will for your time, it, it's foolish. And so this begs the question, how do we know God's will? A couple ways. Uh, we're not going to spend a lot of time on this first one, but uh, this is why we unpack the Bible every week. This is why we encourage you to do it in your gospel community at home is God's will is in God's revealed word to us. What God is most concerned with you knowing, he's already given you. The priorities on how God wants you to invest your time are, are, are sitting in his word. You might not find out what grad program you're supposed to go to, um, if you should marry Steve or not, or what career you should change to, but you'll find the most important priorities that God wants you to spend your time. How to love God, how to spend time with him, how to know his word, how to love people, our brothers and sisters in the church, how to love the overlooked and the helpless, to love the lost who are far from God, how to pursue righteousness and holiness with your time, being on mission, working hard, Sabbathing well. There are so many things on and on that we have in his word. But I, I want to look at this second way that we know God's will, and it's in, because it's in the text, is the spirit of God in us. So look at verse 18. Paul says, Do not get drunk on wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the spirit. So for a lot of people, this is like the, the proof text for don't get drunk. Um, and in, in a sense, yeah, it is. You should not get drunk. Uh, the Bible teaches that. But, but I think Paul is not trying to focus on alcohol. I think he's actually trying to focus on who the Spirit of God is I don't, and, and, and what it looks like for the Christian to be filled with the Spirit of God. So think about this comparison for a minute. When you get drunk, which I know none of you have experience with, uh, so I'll share with you to inform you. Um, you have an outside substance come into you, enter your body that influences you to do things, influences even empowers you to do things that you would not do without it. I was in a fraternity in college. Uh, we would have a social functions with um, a sorority, and there were dry events and wet events. And the dry events, guess what happened? It was like a middle school dance. Guys were like up against the wall, no dancing, no talking to the opposite sex. But if you went to, uh, if you gave guys a few beers, uh, it would change. They'd be under the influence of alcohol, and so they would be like Michael Jackson on the dance floor. Uh, they had confidence talking to women. All of a sudden, it changed. And Paul's saying um, that this is kind of, the, kind of the comparison he's making, is that when, when we are influenced, we are filled with God's Spirit, the very person, the third Trinity, the third person of the Trinity, the Spirit of God is an outside entity, an outside person, really, that enters and influences and empowers the Christian to do things that you would not be able to do without him. And man, the, the Spirit has much more power, much more good influence for us than uh, a fraternity guy and a couple um, drinks. But Paul says, to, to what end? What priority should we have if we're under the influence of the Spirit? And he's, I think these are some evidences we see in verses um, 19 to 21. Listen to this, verses 19 to 21. This is evidence of the Spirit of God filling us. He says, We'll address one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and everything to God the Father in the name of Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. So in short, he's saying the Spirit influences us to heavily prioritize relationships, namely in the church. In fact, this verse is actually framing up a long, um, a, really a, a long section in which we're going to devote about four sermons to in the coming weeks about Spirit-filled relationships. If we're filled with the Spirit, it's going to affect how we view marriage, how we view parenting, how we view a Boston-employee relationship, and even singleness. And so we'll, uh, we'll have those in the coming weeks. But for now, I want to look at what these direct verses instruct us on. 
Look at verse 19. It says, we will, it really, it says we're going to encourage one another. We're going to point each other back to Christ. And so we're filled with the Spirit. We pray for one another when we're discouraged. If we're filled with the Spirit, we take time to remind one another of who you are in Christ that we often forget. Verse 19 and 20 say we're going to devote time to worshiping together. We'll be here gathering together. We'll be a part of a gospel community regularly. We're going to be on mission together. We have a shared mission and worship together. We're going to pray together. And verse 21 says we're going to devote our time submitting to one another. Uh, That means we're going to serve one another's needs above our own. Uh, we do this a lot. You see people, you might give away your whole day or half a day to help someone move. That's like, that's like an MO. Um, I was thinking recently this week about Priscilla who gives away her time to patch up and make clothes for people, including me. Thanks, Priscilla. Uh, meal trains for people in our church is the norm. We give away our priorities to help and love other people. And guess what? I was thinking about this too. Loving one another, serving one another, laying down your life for one another, encouraging one another, it is, it is costly with your time. It takes a lot of time. It's not efficient, but it's near to God's heart and has eternal reward for good. And so guys, I want to ask you, as we've been just going through some of these priorities, are, are these the priorities you are living by with your time? Or, or do we feel like ourselves kind of succumbing to the current around us that says prioritize your, your comfort in your time, your, your personal notoriety, spend your time on that, or spend your time on your, your ambition, or your own little K kingdom, or your hobby, or your entertainment, spend all your time on those things. And friends, even in that, we, we know that we need to cast our eyes to Jesus who perfectly invested his time according to God's priorities. He set aside his comfort, he set aside his own notoriety, and he became a servant and took on death to reveal the very heart of God to save us. As I've been thinking about the sermon, I've been thinking about one of the saddest scenarios that I think I can envision, um, and often sometimes even have a fear of, is, is to get to the end of your life, the picture of someone that gets to the end of their life, and they live a busy, hurried, anxiously driven, focused on the wrong priority kind of life, and, and they got to the end of their life and they were filled with regret, wishing they'd spent their time differently. And honestly, I sometimes fear that I would have those, those regrets at the end of life. And conversely, I actually think on the positive side, there's not much of a greater desire in us than to get to the end of our life and, 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 and feel like, man, I, I invested it well. Not I was per- no, I didn't do it perfectly, but, but I invested it well. I, there was a, a um, more prominent minister that, that passed away recently, and I was talking about this with a friend yesterday, about how just seeing someone live that kind of life, a well-done kind of life, just spurs you on to want that so badly and so deeply. I think... I think, I think God, God has put, put that, that desire, desire. He's placed, placed that desire in my heart and, and in your heart. And it made me think back to the parable of the talents um, in Matthew 25. And in the parable, the master gives treasure to a servant, uh, three servants. And, and they're encouraged to invest it and to multiply it. And when the master comes back, the servants, they give an account. Hey, here's how we multiplied our, our time uh, or the treasure that you gave. And this is what the master says to the ones that multiplied it, that were faithful. He says, well done. Good and faithful servant, you've been faithful over a little, I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. Friends, one of the biggest treasures God's given you to invest in is your time. It is a stewardship. And you know the, one of the biggest things with a stewardship? It means your time is not yours. It's actually his. He's given it to you, a brief time to invest. And one day we're going to stand before him and give an account for the time and how we invested it. And, and I don't know about you, but, but man, I, I hear these words in the parable, and, and that just something, something leaps in my heart to want to hear these words from Jesus, right? These words of, well done, good and faithful servant, good and faithful son, good and faithful daughter. You've been faithful over a little, I'll set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. I want to ask you, did you, Did you feel like that, that, that day, day were today, today, that your life ended today, today and you were giving an account for how your time, how you have been spending your time, how do you think Jesus would respond to you if you were giving an account to your, how you're spending your treasure of time? Would you have any regrets? Would you have any conviction? Um, now, now, I want to, I want to be really careful here. In Christ, there is no condemnation. We, we don't go to Jesus and say, hey, I spent my time like you said, and so let me into heaven. I can be in relationship with you. It's No, we stand fully on the righteousness of Christ. 
in, in our, our foolishness, our selfishness, our people-pleasing, our idolization of comfort, or the things that we struggle with through our time are paid for at the cross. But, but also, I, I want to give some room for conviction because this isn't something God wants from you. He wants to use you for eternal impact, right? We can let that conviction fuel the change because it's in Christ we have everything to grow. We have everything in Christ that we need to grow in wisdom with our time. Jesus is the foundation of wisdom, and he lives in you. Colossians says, in Jesus Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. It all resides in him, and you have him. Jesus is the God of eternity who has secured eternal life for us. He secured that white rope for us to live in him. And Jesus, it says in um, Corinthians, has given us the very mind of Christ because we have his spirit. We have the mind of God. So you can know God's will. You can know his priorities. And you have his people to work it out together. And so, friends, let's consider our priorities. Let's consider how we're spending our time. Wisely or unwisely, temporally or eternally, God's priorities or our priorities. And let's, let's commit to stir one another up as we invest our time for our king. Let's pray. Wow, this text has been, man, so convicting for me this week. I struggle to want to please people above pleasing you. I struggle with the temporal. Even last week on my day off when I was starting this sermon, I was so annoyed at, at the, the most valuable things you placed around me in light of just, just temporary fleeting things. And God, I know all of us uh, do that at times, and we just want to just take a moment to say thank you, that all, all we need is Christ, all we have is Christ, that what we sang out earlier, this beautiful reality of the gospel is, is that we're made, we're accepted because of Christ's merit, not our own, and how we spend our time. But God, in that, we want to live in light of the gospel. We want to walk in light of wisdom, because you fill us with your Spirit. Uh, because we want to have eternal impact. And so, God, I, I pray for any conviction in this room. I pray it wouldn't be from shame or guilt or I need to do this to please God, but I pray for any healthy conviction that would say, how can I model my time that, that's a reflection of, of what God is inviting me into, a reflection of the gospel that I'm already walking in. God, I pray if there's anyone here that doesn't know Christ, I pray the thing they would hear is that I need Jesus. I need his salvation. I need his merit. I need his forgiveness, his redemption. And it's only in him that we have that. So, God, I pray that you would um, just make that clear. And, uh, Father, we, we want to glorify you. We want Jesus' name, that our eternity is not about us. It's about you. The picture and beauty of eternity is about every tribe and tongue and nation gathered around the throne, worshiping King Jesus. And so, God, all this is for, well, meant to be for your glory and your fame, not our own. God, let our time here be leveraged, redeemed, utilized for greater glory and fame and worship of the King of kings. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.